Okay, it is the moment we have all been waiting for. Open beta is right around the corner. As Riot laid out, they've got some patch notes, which uh, I figured I'd go through and give my thoughts on. Honestly, I wasn't sure I wanted to do a video on this. I kind of prefer doing more edited, tightly scripted videos, but I figured at least a couple of people asked me to in the comments, so might as well give it a shot. Please forgive me if it's not quite as uh, high fidelity as some of the other stuff I've been doing recently. A couple of notes with respect to the approach I'm going to be taking going through these notes. Two main things. Firstly, I will not be reading or discussing or thinking about anything to do with expeditions, because I don't play expeditions outside of, I guess, as I'm trying to unlock the cards, I guess I'll do one a week or something like that. But it's not really for me. It's not my kind of gameplay. It's not the kind of experience I enjoy. So if you're looking for that kind of limited resources content, you're going to have to check out a different channel. Secondly, I don't really want to address any of the economy changes. For a start, I don't really understand them that well. And secondly, I don't understand them that well because they're not really aimed at me. I personally kind of abhor the economy system in this game. Again, personally though, like I understand it's great for a lot of people, but for me, it's just a massive pain in the butt. So I'm not gonna talk about any of those features. And if you're looking for that breakdown, again, you're gonna have to look somewhere else. All right, everything else though, I'm excited to talk about. So let's head on into the patch notes. All right, so first up, obviously, we've got the ranked stuff going on. There's not a ton to talk about here. It is what it is, but I'm definitely very excited to see what decks rise to the top. Okay, this is a feature I've been really looking forward to. Obviously, being able to challenge other players is a great way, assuming you have a, you know, a playtesting community, to try and figure out great decks ahead of the curve and improve. That being said, personally, as someone who grew up in England and who now lives in America, most of my like friends who I would test with are on the European shard. It's actually a consideration for me whether or not I just play on Europe. I don't really know how easily it will be to swap region uh, should you want to, and I did buy some of the coins on North America when I didn't have the option to choose before. So with all of that being said, hard to say. I do think there's one interesting like perspective that I can add on this stuff that I don't know, you know if other content creators are going to touch on. Which is simply to say that, as much as possible, I think it's worth cutting Riot some slack with respect to having the shards uh, in place for matchmaking. It's easy to understand the perspective that, given the fact that this is a card game and latency doesn't particularly affect the experience, why not just have everyone on one shard? I think, you know, having worked at a game publisher and having studied game development in university, I, I have some understanding of at least a couple of the reasons why that's actually a lot more if not necessarily strictly complicated, although it is strictly complicated in some instances, it's kind of just not in the publisher or developer's interest to do. You know, for example, you know, I wasn't going to talk about the economy stuff, but the economy stuff is going to be different depending on the region that you're in, which means that to a certain extent, players can unlock things at different rates because of the economy systems. So even if you, you know, allowed for uh, people to spend different currencies within one one ecosystem. Uh, you would unfortunately probably find that some countries had an advantage and could get things more quickly. Also, server maintenance, even if you know the, the ping isn't bad for you and the gameplay experience is, a, is fine, maintaining the servers wherever that central location is is kind of going to be a pain in the butt. So yeah, I, I definitely understand why it is the way it is, but it's a little unfortunate. Okay, boards and guardians. Uh, this stuff isn't really... Stuff I'm particularly caring about, but I do think it's cool. My honest hope, though, is that you can maybe unlock some stuff for placing highly in the ranks. League's always been really good about that. I mean, they were doing that stuff way back when I was playing League in, you know, Season Zero and stuff. They, they, they did that way earlier than a lot of other companies with their Victorious skin line. So I would imagine that there will be things you can unlock, which I'm uh, excited to find out what those will be. All right, so my cat Angelina has joined us for the real meat of these patch notes, which is, of course, the card updates. And the first one is a doozy. So first things first, Anivia changed quite substantially. She was obviously part of a pretty problematic deck in the last preview patches. But with that being said, my hope was actually that they were going to nerf Splinter Soul instead of Anivia, because in my opinion, that's more of a problem card in the macro view of as they continue to release more and more cards because it really is a card that can be broken with many things whereas Anivia, yeah oblivious islander was really good with her but at the same time i i feel like splinter soul has so many more instances where it can be broken by the existence of other things that being said at least they did change 
the deck that was broken, and I don't actually think that these changes are quite as much of a nerf as maybe some other people do. I think this is a nerf, don't get me wrong, but I also think that the power level of the card itself versus, you know, that specific implementation of Anivia has moved more laterally. Specifically, I think that she is going to now maybe be one of the few champions that is explicitly and uh, actually good in control decks. The atrocity control lists that I've been playing recently and some other ones that I've been seeing on YouTube don't really use champions. I was thinking of cutting the Elises from my list, and part of the reason why is that frankly none of the champions are really that good in a control shell. You know, some people would probably instinctively think that Karma was, but she's really not a very good card, I think. So the fact that she can now block is a much bigger buff than I think people realize. And I think additionally, the fact that she doesn't get to uh, level up and revive until she actually gets enlightened, whilst something that you know slows down the deck considerably, it doesn't actually stop you from creating lots of eggs. You know, you can still do that. So assuming that you can create a bunch of eggs and now those eggs can block and then Nivea can block, right? That's a good stalling option. And if you can stall into the late game and all those eggs flip, suddenly you've got the massive board of Anivias that you're used to. So yeah, my instinct actually says that I don't think this is a buff or anything, but I think this is a much more sideways move than I've been seeing uh, discussed. So I'm excited to maybe even try some Freljord Shadow Isles uh, control decks. I think before this change, honestly, there was no reason to go for that color combination rather than Ionia for Deny. But now I actually think you have a pretty good win condition baked into uh, Freljord if you decide to go for control. Okay, so Ezreal obviously got nerfed, I think, pretty heavily. There's no denying that. Some people might be a little confused as to why the nerf happened, but if you read their notes, assuming that the data is there to back up that he basically immediately ended any game where he leveled up, even if he didn't level up that often, that's still a huge problem. Because, you know, his effect that allows for him to be leveled up is something that is enabled by a plethora of cards, and it will only be enabled by more and more cards as the sets grow. So given that fact, I think it's actually probably a good thing that they preempted this. There are some very rare edge cases where I actually think that the new uh, implementation of Ezreal is a buff, but I don't think it's going to happen terribly often. Decks that wanted to run this card still want to run this card. It's just that they're a little less powerful now. And to be honest, I would say that they are only a little less powerful because probably the games where he flips now, you're still going to win for the same reasons. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about this one. Vladimir's changes, I don't think, or change, I don't think does enough to justify running self-harm in the metagame. Perhaps I will be surprised, but if you're looking for more insight and context as to why I'm suggesting that self-harm isn't worth playing, you can check out my meta snapshot videos. I'm actually a pretty big fan of this Trendemir nerf, even though he wasn't exactly oppressive in my testing. The thing about Trendemir is that, especially with the tough keyword, he's kind of a new player crusher. Uh, to put it politely. The fact that you have to be running Shadow Isles to hard remove this card, or maybe you could get some tempo removal options with Ionia, but that's not really the same thing, meant that it was very difficult for a lot of the decks that were kind of just do nothing, play minions, whatever decks that a lot of people instinctively build when they start a card game. So I actually think that this change is quite nice. It's not as though the tough was something that was the reason you played this card, assuming you were going to play him in a more thoughtful list. I don't think that Trendemir is going to be seeing a ton of play at the top levels, just because of the fact that in terms of win conditions, why would you play this when you could play something that has a far more immediate effect or a far more rapid effect even? So Let's say, for example, that you're finishing a game with Ledros. That obviously does a ton of damage up front, and it keeps recurring, even if there is a bunch of removal. The, all, the other thing that you know kind of fills this place, and there's, there's, I guess there's a cycle of minions that are very high-costed in every faction, but you, know, you could look at something like... Um, What's the name of the card I'm thinking of? The guy that adds all the decimates to your hand in Noxus. You know, even that I would argue is kind of a better finisher than Trendemir is. So yeah, I, I think this change is quite good. It really just stops unpleasant gameplay experiences for new players. All right, so to, to my point earlier, I'm going to be skipping over Battlesmith. This is just a rarity change for Expeditions. Looking though at Fleet Feather Tracker, I am absolutely in love with the way that they nerfed this card. It was definitely far too good in the previous patches. And now, given the fact that 
you still can get that same effect, but you have to kind of work for it and you have to kind of think about it. I think it's just a far better design. It's more rewarding to play with this card and it's less frustrating to play against it. This is also somewhat of a shadow buff to Teemo and other combo pieces that you tried to drop extremely early, like as early as turn one. The reason being that, let's say for example, you're queuing up and you have Fleet Feather Tracker in your opener and you're on attack on turn one. Well, getting two damage in is fine, but a lot of those decks would actually rather save Fleet Feather Tracker for later to enable like a big heavy hitter to get through in a combat anyway. And saving Spellman is not bad, right? So in cases where you see a Teemo on the other side, really good players are sometimes going to consider or would have been considering with the previous Fleet Feather Tracker, okay, let's just not play this because if they have a Teemo in their opening hand, they're not going to play it because we have the initiative and we play first. It can bait that Teemo player into playing it and it gets picked off by the Fleet Feather Tracker, which is a very like coin flippy interaction. Whereas now, sure, this does mean that Teemo is going to hit on turn two more often against decks that ran Fleet Feather Tracker, but I would argue that's probably okay. Teemo himself, I think, is actually a little too strong, but this way of dealing with that was a little frustrating. Okay, so Avaros and Hearthguard, I, I believe to be, have been a pretty balanced card, and I kind of still just think it's balanced with the uh, extra health removed. It wasn't something which was ever the reason why you played the card. It was kind of just an extra bell and whistle for the effect, which is what you were really looking for. So the nerf doesn't bother me too much. Decks that still want this effect still want to run this card. I actually think that uh, people have not seen the ways in which you can break this guy. And I think there are some ways in which you can break this guy. So I'm looking forward to brewing a little bit with Freylord this, this time around. I didn't get a ton of time to do it in the preview patches. Okay, so the next two are really interesting ones. If Warm Other Control wasn't dead uh, in preview patch 2, then it is certainly dead now. Catalyst being nerfed to 5 mana and Wording Stone is getting a health reduction are both pretty impactful for a couple of reasons. I'll start with Catalyst. So Catalyst, given the fact that Anivia got changed in the way that she did. I actually think nerfing this, even for this patch, probably was a good call, even if it has a splash damage effect of hurting uh, a deck that a lot of people enjoyed playing in the preview patches. This slows it down pretty considerably. You can no longer bank spell mana and play this uh, as early as you could, and that is quite a big impact. I think their point about you know differentiating it from Warding Stones, I don't really think that's a legitimate point, personally. I think Having one being the burst spell, one being the creature that can block things is already a pretty substantial differentiator, even if the heal arguably counts as a block. But the biggest thing that they mentioned, which I think is very legitimate, is that this allows for them to add better ramp tools in the future. I think that had they kept Catalysts the same and Wording Stones the same and only given ramp, let's say, to Freylord or whatever new faction they add, it could have maybe gotten out of control a little bit because they are both easily accessible very early in the game. However, given the fact that balanced patches are going to be happening pretty routinely, I'm not sure I totally agree with the philosophy of nerfing things with a forward-thinking perspective because, you know, you could just nerf those things or the other thing or the combo of things once that actually becomes a problem, which I am confident that Catalyst was not a problem, at least in preview patch 2. It may have been a problem with Anivia being buff in control, but I, I don't agree with this, uh, this argument about the future in the sense that, you know, if you're going to be changing the game a lot, you might as well just wait until it's a problem. Wording Stones, though, this one is a much bigger nerf. The difference between 4 and 3 health is absolutely massive. The fact that you have... Uh, a ton of removal spells that can deal three, the fact that you have things like Fiora, which at the very least are going to be popular because of the big streamers that were playing that deck in the preview patches. This basically kills the card, in my opinion. You know, you will still run it if you're playing a ramp plan, but I kind of feel like just don't, and then maybe run the guy that is like a 3-1 that frostbites something. You buy yourself a turn nine times out of ten, and you also have a thing that can actually trade with one of the aggro units pushing you down. This really doesn't serve much of a purpose anymore, so uh, it, it just, I kind of disagree with this nerf actually. Okay, Cloud Drinker, this is another forward thinking one. I personally didn't find anything that was explicitly an infinite combo that seemed problematic or consistent in any way. It's, I wonder perhaps if just the possibility of an infinite combo in, in the current set 
was enough for them to not want to allow it, even if it was inconsistent, that would kind of signal a bit of a troubling balance mentality to me, but it's hard to know if that's the case because I certainly, as I said, didn't find a problematic infinite combo. I do think that uh, in the same vein as Catalyst, like, yeah, preventing this in the future from doing really dumb things probably makes sense, but I also think there is no reason for this to be nerfed now. Miracles was already kind of a middling to bad deck, so letting those players have their fun, I think, was a little bit more important. Okay, so Flame Chompers kind of need all the help they can get, in my opinion. I know this was actually nerfed from preview patch 1 to preview patch 2, which I think was insane. The fact that it's getting buffed up now uh, kind of belies the point that I've made in a few videos, which is that I think discard aggro is atrociously bad. Yeah, I personally would buff this card more or remove it and rethink the way that discard uh, works in this game. Okay, so a bunch of these cards that we're about to look at are kind of expeditions focused. I'm not really going to talk about those. I'm just going to skip directly to the ones which I think are pretty interesting, and the first of which is Boom Crew Rookie. This is a card that was already playable fringely, in my opinion. It was in, for example, a burn Teemo list that I ran. It was probably good in some other burn lists at the very least as well. Maybe a Bogles list could have used this card. Uh, that's actually something that, now that I think about it, I want to try. But in any case, I think it was fine to good before, and now I think it's good to great. The fact that it has this one attack means that it is actually going to be able to profitably interact with some of the early plays of like the Dawn Speaker value decks that run spiders. The fact that it has this one attack means that in cases where you're playing against control, your clock is just that one point of damage quicker per turn, which is pretty relevant. And it was always a good card in aggressive lists because of its health total, too. This gets around a lot of removal. Four is a lot more than three, as I mentioned before. It's also a lot more than two, which most cards that could deal three damage for two mana uh, in one attack would have two health in Legends of Runeterra. So this is one I would definitely keep your eyes out for. It's got a lot of potential, and I think there's a lot of deck homes it could find. Next up, I don't think this one is going to be seen a lot, but I think now it can be seen. It kind of went from terrible to bad slash situational, and that's Parade Electro Rig. I think players might underestimate that this card actually does something that could be quite valuable in not specific combos, but specific metagames. What I mean by that is I think that control right now is going to be a little overtuned heading into the beta, and having a card that allows for you to shuffle valuable things back into your deck and get more copies of them is actually pretty good. Additionally, having four power is a huge change, as I mentioned before, but it's especially huge for combo pieces. And this is definitely a combo piece. If you have a combo piece that has three health, that's the first place that someone who's playing Grasp of the Undying or the Box or Fiora is going to look to interrupt your game plan. This guy having four health means that even if you attack with it and it dies because they have a blocker and one of those things, the key is the and. They weren't able to stop you from getting the support trigger off in the first place. So I actually think there's a world where we start to see some Parade Electro Rig. Depending on the way the meta goes, and depending on how many decks really care about the value that it provides. I'll briefly talk about Plaza Guardian. I think that this card was middling at best before, and it's kind of still middling at best. The decks that want to run it still will. I think personally the deck which maybe is most appropriate for this card is some kind of burn list that is playing spells specifically aggressively, because having a 6-6 quick attacker in the late game against Ruination, Vengeance, Rasa, there's so many things that just you getting the value of a zero mana or even three mana, four mana, six, six, just they don't care about that. In order to utilize this card, you need to be getting it earlier than like turn five. Maybe a Bogles. I'm telling you, Bogles, there's something to this idea. If you guys don't know what Bogles is, it's a deck in Magic the Gathering that basically focuses on playing little things, but then making them very big by playing lots and lots of buffs on them. It's kind of like the Infect deck I mentioned in Lucian and Teemo standalone, with the difference being that you're dealing your damage normally, and that the buffs you're applying are permanent rather than temporary. Okay, Used Cast Salesman is one I'm very excited about. This card was... I actually think maybe just straight playable, not even fringe, before. I didn't personally use it at all in the preview patches, but it was one of the ones I was looking at most specifically in my theory crafting in the downtime uh, up until now. I'm pretty confident that there is something that uses this card that is very good. I've got a couple of different ideas. You guys should stay tuned, because once I find the specifics, I'll be sure to let you know. 
Okay, no one didn't see this one coming. The rekindling badly needed a nerf. I actually suggested in my feedback that this go down to a 4-3, and I think for all the reasons mentioned above, the fact that it didn't and it only went down to 4-4 uh, is a very big deal. Basically, the only thing this really impacts is you're searching it with Babbling Bjerg. That that deck just I don't think is very good, especially with the Anivia nerf. You know, maybe if Anivia was still what she was, having a tutor effect in Freylord would allow for this to be kind of obnoxious uh, at five power. But the four health is just you know it's like the the parade electro rig that I mentioned before. This is now no longer something you can deal with very effectively with one card, unless it's a very very valuable card, which arguably. Uh, should be being used on the threats that this guy's even perhaps trying to resurrect. So I am of the opinion that the Rekindler archetype, the value town one I mentioned in my tier list, my, my meta snapshot, has not changed substantially in its power level because of this nerf. All right, finally, we have Wraith Caller. This is basically an expedition change, in my opinion. I do not think that this card really has a place in Constructed. Any deck which would be running it may as well run something. Okay, let's move on to the watch list. So they talk about Deny here and a dash of Elusive. Personally, like, I don't want to really get into this debate, but I do not think that Deny should be changed. I think it would be absolutely insane to make it any worse than it is currently. The rest of the game feels very much like it is built around exactly what Deny is currently. What I mean by that is, I mean, if, if anyone remembers Artifact other than me, um, perhaps Annihilation would be a good reference point. The fact that Annihilation costs what it costs and does what it does allows for other things to exist the way that they exist. It's like the Jenga block that if you pull out, everything else just comes crashing down. There are so many absolutely insane things that will happen with Control decks if Deny gets changed at all. The fact that it is easily accessible to an aggressive deck is one of the most important elements of the card. I understand that, especially for people not coming from like a magic background, the idea of a counter can feel pretty oppressive to them doing fun, stupid stuff. But at the same time, do you want another Hearthstone? Because that's what you'll get if the game is just fun, stupid stuff all the time. Some people really enjoy that game. It's not a bad game, I'm not saying that, but it's not for me. And I really want to make sure that when thinking about the impact that a, chain to, uh, a nerf specifically to deny would have, that people realize that it is far more interlinked with the balance of the rest of the game than maybe they're giving it credit for. So with respect to elusive stuff, on a lighter note, this one was a little surprising to me. I didn't personally feel like there was a ton of really broken elusive stuff. I assume that what they are referring to is the Zed Hecarim Shark Chariot deck specifically the more aggressive skew. I don't particularly think that that deck needs a nerf, so we'll see. I think it's good that this is on the watch list and that they didn't preemptively change those cards. I didn't find myself to be having too many challenges against that deck. It is definitely like a an A to S tier deck, as I said in my meta snapshot, but irrespective of that, it's one of the healthier ones that lived there at the time and I think will still live there. Okay, so this section is weird to me. I straight up just disagree that this is appropriate to call minor tweaks and clarity. Changing a play effect to a summon is insanely effect. Like, I just, I can't believe they're calling that a minor tweak. The fact that one of the most broken things you can do in the game is recursion through Mist's Call, Splinter Soul, like all these things that trigger summon effects uh, for very cheap amounts of mana, the fact that for some reason they're considering a change from play to summon is just mind-blowing to me. That being said, if they are only referencing it in this way because of the specific cards, fine. But I hope that when this change happens to more interesting ones, it doesn't get buried down in the notes. Legion General and Green Glade Elder probably won't see a ton more play as a result of this, although... I do think that there might be an Ionia Shadow Isles hand buff deck that could get some mileage out of this. So we'll have to see what happens there. Also not a minor tweak in my opinion is the units that can now be played on a full board. That is kind of wild to me. Like you can now, for example, if, if your hand allows for it, play Navori Conspirator after an attack where you have six units to get some kind of useful effect 
back but still get the value of that attack with only two actions. Ravenous Butcher is a really interesting one because you now can clear a board slot as well as, as being able to play it in that jammed up position, which honestly makes the card a lot better in some of those more aggressive, you know, kill your own things lists. Um, sorry, I meant Ancient Crocolith there. But yeah, I think this is a pretty big change. Similarly with Possession, I assume that that means it killed the unit before. I didn't actually test that myself. Really interesting that they considered these to be minor. But other than those changes I mentioned, I don't particularly feel like there's a lot worth going into here. It is cool that they made the Rally keyword more condensed. I think that is a smart thing to do. It does kind of indicate that maybe they want to add more of it to the game. And I think the amount of it in set one is probably just right. So hopefully it doesn't get too out of hand in the future. All right, so I personally much preferred the clarity of the old system of showing who had initiative. I can understand how for newer players, it might have been a little counterintuitive that seeing a shield on the opposing side of the board, then that player using something which let them attack would be a little strange. Like you would, it would be easy to maybe get confused if you weren't following entirely the, the card effects and you didn't know how those worked. That being said, yeah, my, my preference was the previous system. I felt like it was more clear, uh, to me at least. I'm not too bothered by this. Let's move on. Champion visibility. I'm a huge fan of the fact that in a best of one ladder game, you can see champions ahead of the mulligan phase. I think that that is like one of the smartest things they've done to ensure that there are just so many, there's, there's never, or it's not that there's never, but there are far fewer instances where you just have blowout games because you just mulligan for the wrong strategy. Because, oh, let's say right now 60% of the meta is aggressive. So you mulligan to deal with that, and they're playing control, and you lose the game because of it. That sucks, you know? And you'll still see that sometimes. I actually think that it is cool that you can specifically lure your opponent into a false sense of security, but what doesn't feel good in other card games is where that sense of uh, security just doesn't exist at all, and it's a sense of hopelessness. <laughs> so in, in absence of a, of a sideboarding system in a best of three ranked ladder, this seems very smart to me. I actually proposed something in a, my feedback post on Reddit a while back, which I still would love to see tried at some point, which is basically allowing for some kind of competitive mode where a sideboarding phase happens pre-mulligan, but after the champions get seen, because I think that would possibly allow for even better quality of games on average. But I can understand that, you know, perhaps sideboarding in this game is just a little too impactful blanketly because there are some other elements of sideboarding in Legends of Runeterra that I would be pretty concerned about specifically in like let's say in game two you're on the draw well maybe you straight up have your sideboard fully comprised of different uh, like odd or even costing units so that when you're on the draw versus the play you can massively increase your chances of being able to play something and then open attack the next turn or massively increase your chances of having the right response to their aggressive units. Yeah, I could see how that would be a little frustrating in some cases. So yeah, anyway, I rambled about this for too long. I digress. Let's move on. This is why I like to edit my videos better, by the way. Miscellaneous. This is hugely awesome to me. I was a big Eternal player. The keyboard shortcuts seem to be basically the same in this game. And to this day, like one of my biggest confusions with Hearthstone is the fact that they don't have a spacebar and this turn hotkey option. Maybe they do now. I haven't played it in a while, admittedly, but the fact that Eternal did it, and then for years, it seemed like they weren't doing it. Uh, even if they have that now, that's kind of crazy to me. So uh, the fact that we've got it here is super cool. Nothing else really seems too impactful there. None of the bug fixes or known issues uh, are things that I think are too interesting. So that basically wraps up all of the notes. I guess my final thoughts on this would be that I kind of hoped for a bigger shakeup than we saw. My experience with the preview patches sort of showed me at least what I thought were a few truisms, which were that Noxus was a little too weak, for example. And I'm surprised not to see any addressing of that in these notes. I get the impression that there is something myself and, and many others are missing with respect to that faction, but I've done a decent amount of theory crafting during the break, trying to think of how to make Noxus work. I think there's maybe a control deck, which could be okay. I think there's some burn decks, which are pretty good, but yeah, I would have liked to see the region fleshed out a little bit more. I think the identity of that region even could have used some reworking and retooling because it was 
and is, I guess, a little one-dimensional, in my opinion. So yeah, I mean, the, the update is interesting. There are some needed changes, at least to decks, even if I don't agree with the cards specifically. I would have preferred, for example, uh, as I mentioned, that Anivia stay the same as Winter Soul be nerfed. But yeah, if you guys uh, enjoyed this, let me know, because I'd be surprised if you did. This isn't my normal editing style, and I, I definitely uh, feel it as I'm going through this. But I do have a quick announcement to make. So I'm not going to be streaming very often. I don't really enjoy it that much. But I do think that it would be cool to do a stream tomorrow specifically. So if you want to come chat with me as I'm trying to figure out what decks to rush for early and... You know, if you want to talk about any of the videos on my channel, that kind of thing, you are more than welcome to join me in my stream tomorrow. It's slash AJCast, so there'll be a link in the description below. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If you didn't mind the rambliness, maybe drop a comment and I'll consider making more of these. The, the biggest issue that I've run into with the approach I've taken in, in the last few videos is that I have a very busy life and trying to find time to edit stuff is, is pretty difficult. So... If there's enough of a value proposition here for people to enjoy, then maybe I'll consider doing more stuff like this. But for the time being, I'm going to be focusing on uh, more highly edited content. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll catch you tomorrow on stream for Legends of Runeterra.